Hello there, it's Antrice, and welcome to another episode of the Savvy Painter Podcast. Savvy Painter is the podcast for painters who know that mastering your craft is a lifelong venture. They understand that the hardest part is showing up every day, whether they're inspired or not, and that we're all in this together. For the past three years, the Savvy Painter podcast has been sharing tips and techniques that you can use every day in your studio. And when you join the Savvy Painter email list now, you get a collection of inspiring quotes and practical advice collected from years of Savvy Painter interviews. Just go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash subscribe to sign up for weekly emails and get your free PDF, Essential Tips for Artists. Each week, I interview established artists like Anne Gale, Scott Connery, Rebecca Crowell, and many other artists who are willing to open their studio doors, share their painting processes, and talk candidly about what it takes to consistently grow your skills. We get into the nitty gritty of their daily studio practice, what tricks they play on themselves to avoid getting caught up in perfectionism, how to use flashcards as reminders to stay on track during long painting sessions, and other cool tactics to quiet the inner critic and continue moving towards excellence. The Savvy Painter podcast is filled with artists who generously share their stories, and by sharing their stories, they show the rest of us that we are not alone. So join us with the Savvy Painter email list and get even more connected with weekly emails. Sign up now and you get essential tips for artists, the inspiring quotes and practical advice collected from years of Savvy Painter interviews. Go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash subscribe. It's that easy. Ralph Gilbert is my guest this week. Ralph is a figurative narrative painter and muralist. He studied at the Chouinard Art Institute, which today is the California Institute of the Arts in Los Angeles. He also received an MFA from UC Santa Barbara. In this episode, Ralph talks about his experience as a public artist whose work incorporates diverse cultures, history, and a deep connection to the communities that he serves. Ralph talks about the large public projects he's created for the St. Paul Union Depot in Minnesota and the Piedmont Park Conservancy in Atlanta, Georgia, where he now lives. Ralph shares how he conceptualizes these large-scale murals, what he does to prepare, and how even when he spends up to a year preparing to paint, he still leaves room for improvisation. Ralph also talks about the grant process and the sometimes difficult work of finding openings for figurative work in public spaces. Murals are just one piece of Ralph's body of work. He also shares how poetry inspired his latest series of paintings and another series that was inspired by watching his infant daughter sleeping. How watching her sleep turned into a curiosity of what babies dream of before they have language. So without further ado, here is Ralph Gilbert. Ralph, thank you so much for joining me on the Savvy Painter podcast. I'm excited to speak with you. Well, same here. Thank you. Can you tell me a little bit about how you got started as an artist? What inspired you to pursue this vocation? Well, I think those are two questions and good questions. The first is that I began drawing early, was more of a serious musician early in my life, classical musician, but my mother was an artist, a student of Rico Lebrun, an art teacher for children. And I frequently went with her to her classes, which were at the Pasadena Art Museum and later at the Los Angeles County Art Museum. And I didn't distinguish myself tremendously, but there was something about being in the museum that was very, I don't know, it it imprinted on me, I think, in in a really important way. I didn't pursue it with any seriousness, went to college, took a beginning drawing class that I thought was very bad. And there's a bit of a funny story. After taking that drawing class, I took a trip to Mexico driving, and I took along a box of drawing materials and a sketch pad and really didn't touch them at all. Went to Oaxaca and on the way back stopped in Mexico City And my car was broken into, and the box of drawing materials and the sketchbook, along with everything else, were stolen. And when I came down and found that that stuff was missing, it just drove me absolutely wild. The idea that I wouldn't have the drawing materials was completely unnerving, and it was kind of the moment that changed my life. I immediately got in the car, drove back to California, dropped out of school and started 
seriously studying drawing. Wow. It's, it's a funny kind of story, and it's, it's an epiphany story. And it wasn't because I was working, but because I was deprived of the opportunity to work and realized I couldn't be happy without having those drawing materials at hand. So I just continued that at that point to study with various teachers outside of a formal program. I was not a matriculating student, but I went to the Chouinard Art Institute, which became CalArts later on. Mm -hmm. Studied briefly at Cal State University Northridge, and after a couple of years, felt that I was ready to go back and study formally. And I applied to the graduate program at UC Santa Barbara to study under Howard Warshaw. Mm -hmm. And I took him a portfolio of drawings and told him that I was there to apply to grad school, but that there was only one problem. I had never gotten an undergrad degree. And he, I'm very grateful to say, I can't say it to him directly anymore, that he agreed with me and went to the chancellor and they got a special dispensation and I was, I was accepted as a graduate student. Wow. Just on the basis of a portfolio of drawings and finished fairly early. I think I was just turning 25 and then was invited to remain there and teach, which I did for a couple of years. Wow, that's a great story. I love this idea that it was sort of that that very pivotal moment when you didn't have the ability to draw or that somebody took your your tools away. And had you had you already sort of filled that sketchbook at that point? I hadn't touched it. Oh. It, it was it, That's the one silver lining. A, right. <laughs> it was just all gone and that that's all it took. <laughs> That is a fantastic story. So how long were you teaching at UCSB? Well, I taught there in the College of Creative Studies and then at Santa Barbara City College. And at a certain point, I just felt like I hadn't set out to be a teacher. I'd set out to be an artist, to make a livelihood of of my art. And I was going to move from Santa Barbara to LA and just try to make a living drawing. And I I did that and bounced around, but I ended up, after working, doing some freelance work for NBC, doing drawings for a Ray Charles special, and then went on to apply to Disney and had an interesting, I got hired by Disney and I spent just about, just under a year there. It was a fascinating time and I learned a great deal. Among the things I learned was that I was not a cartoonist (laughs) And that I was culturally not particularly well suited for that environment. But I still learned a great deal there, things that still resonate some in my work. So it was a great experience. I made a living drawing. Yeah. Not without difficulty, because when you're drawing in a way that has to be seamless with 60 other artists, Mm -hmm. you're basically giving up your identity and, Mm -hmm. and assuming an identity that that is consistent, that you do that eight hours a day, five days a week. And then when you quit, it's not like just taking off a coat, you know, it's sort of neurologically takes hold of you. And it took a while to get that line out of my system and to return to who I was as an artist. Can you give some examples of some of the things that you took away from? I mean, that right there, what you just said is a fabulous takeaway and very well said, because I, as you know, I used to work at Disney also. Yes. But I'm curious, can you give some examples of some of the other things that you took away from that experience that helped you down the road? Mm -hmm. I think that the main one was that how much could be communicated through the body. You know, it's interesting that you tend to watch a film like that and you think you've heard a lot of dialogue, but really most of what's communicated is communicated gesturally through body language, through gesture, through a kind of physical attitude. And as I progressed and began working very narratively on my own, that has been a crucial consideration for me in developing imagery. And it also, I think, made me quite independent of photographic reference. I find that to get the expression I want, I have to somehow feel it within myself and even to the extent of acting it out, that having people pose for me, whether they're posing live or posing for photographs or just appropriating or finding photographs has never worked. 
there's always some sense for me in which the action is frozen. It becomes a bit academic and static. Mm. So all of the figures that I do are invented, though I would add that they're invented with a with a very long background in observational drawing and and I, I hope to say competence in in drawing the figure. And your work, you do large scale murals. How would you for somebody who hasn't seen your work before, how would you describe it? Well, it's the it I would describe as multifaceted. So the work you're referring to, the murals are some of them huge. The most recent project was for the St. Paul Union Depot in Minnesota. And that that was a cycle of six murals that were roughly five feet or six feet wide by about 16 feet tall with arched tops. So very gothic feeling shape, but huge. And I had to work on a scaffold. Yeah. Those are, they described them as multicultural history murals. So they gave me five themes out of six panels. I had to come up with a theme on my own, but I was really working very collaboratively with them to tell their story. And the story they wanted to tell was about the development of the railroad in Minnesota and the way that it shaped the community. And it was a great project. I spent about a year just preparing for it. So I did an enormous number of drawings, watercolors, oil paintings, so that when I faced these giant panels, I wasn't entirely intimidated by the size. And you can't improvise on that scale. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, it seems like it would be really hard. (laughs) It would be really hard. And so I was ready. And it's not as if I did plans that were then considered immutable. And in fact, when I started working on the big pieces, several major changes were, were, of course, involved. One was I was working on a very different substrate. Uh, These were done on aluminum honeycomb cord panels with fiberglass facing. So it feels different to work on that than canvas or even on a pa- on a wood panel. Yeah, I don't I don't think I even know what that is. <laughs> well, it's 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 an airplane wing basically oh, except okay. that instead of instead of an aluminum facing, it was a fiberglass facing. And it was a great surface to work on, but it changes the way the shapes go on and the way everything feels and looks. And of course the scale changes. And so as I went from studies that were exhaustive to the big panels, I found that a great many things changed and had to change and changed in a way that was appropriate for that scale. When I prepare, I guess my my concept is that I'm getting ready without exactly well, as the painter Jack Levine described it this way, he said, the best advice for a fighter is not to leave your fight in the gym. And what he meant by that was that you can't prepare so much and exhaust yourself so much in preparation that there's nothing left when you get in the ring. So for me, I did all this preparation and then found that I was ready to do a certain amount of change, improvising, adding things, taking things away, changing scale, changing my notions of color. But I was confident in doing that because I had prepared rather well for it. Mm-hmm. That makes a lot of sense. It's, you know, since you're a musician, then it's sort of like going through the rehearsals and then being ready to go on stage and respond to all the other elements that are happening on stage. That's a very good comparison. And the other really big mural I did was in Atlanta for the Piedmont Park Conservancy. And that's a barrel vault, 20 by 40 feet. And that one, the St. Paul murals I painted in Atlanta, and they were shipped by truck and installed in the grand waiting room of the Union Depot. But the Piedmont Park Conservancy mural was painted on site on a scaffold. And so I was up in the air painting overhead. And that too was a challenge. You can't do anything like project studies onto the wall because the wall is curved. Right. And you're not only working overhead, but on on a barrel vault, from the bottom toward the top, you're working from far to close. So you're not even parallel to the painting surface. Oh my gosh. The painting surface is oblique in relation to you. How do you even start to plan for that? Well, 
I have some of the preparatory work on my website and it was, I thought I was well prepared, but the physical, visual, kinesthetic experience was so different when I climbed up on that scaffold. And one of the things that I had to learn was how to anticipate how I was doing. In other words, I had to, while up there, I had to imagine how it would look from down below. Mm -hmm. So for the first several months, I was constantly climbing down and checking myself from a normal eye level. Mm -hmm. But as I got more acclimated, I was able to anticipate the effects of the curved surface, the normal and low point of view in relation to the work. And it was a, it was a real process of acclimatizing. Yeah. It sounds like you're painting. It's, to me, it sounds like you're doing the mental task of painting while doing calculus at the same time or something like that. Well, it was, yeah. I mean, that again, a good comparison. It was, it was really interesting, fun, tough. Um, also, it was a public building and people were coming in and out and doing their business of one kind or another while working. And so it was, it was an, uh, it was a kind of another interesting part of the experience that I was working. I mean, normally as an artist, you work in a rather solitary way. I certainly do. Mm -hmm. In that case, I was working in a very public way. And that too was, was kind of informative because people made comments I didn't invite them to make comments, but I didn't resist it. You know, mm -hmm. I wasn't constantly saying, what do you think? How am I doing? On the other hand, people would, would volunteer things. And sometimes they volunteered things that made a difference. Really? Yeah. Can you give an example of that? Well, I think one was, I'm always very concerned with public work about diversity. But one person came in and said, you know, I don't see anybody here with a physical disability. And... When you think about diversity, you might think in a slightly more limited way, but that was a good point. Mm -hmm. And I did ultimately include somebody, I guess it was with a, with a walker or crutches, I forget which, but that's a small example. But there were lots and lots of instances in that process where things occurred to me while working. One example was that I would go very early in the morning. The building overlooked the lake, Lake Claramere, and Early in the morning, there'd be this beautiful blue heron that would come fly in and land on a, on a dock. And it was never part of my studies, never part of my plan, but it made sense for it to be there, and I painted him in. So there were just all kinds of thing, opportunities that occurred by doing the work on site that would not have occurred to me had I done it in my studio. And it sounds to like I'm just imagining and from my very limited perspective, because I've never done anything close to the scale that you're talking about. But to to change something like adding another figure with a walker in it, or crutches or whatever it was that ended up being there, that seems like a pretty significant change. Did you go back to the sketches? Or how do you? <laughs> no, I just invented it. And on, put it in on the spot. Yeah. In the end, I'm, I'm very I keep reminding myself that I'm not putting in a person. These are shapes. They're lines. They can be added. They can be taken away. If I did it once, I can do it better. So I'm not afraid to take something out. Mm -hmm. When you take on a project like that, when I walked into that building and looked up at the 20 by 40 foot barrel vault, I realized that the only way I could succeed was if I, if I really became as courageous a painter as I could be because the potential there was to either succeed or fail monumentally. Mm. And I just decided, let me go for it. I, I could just add a figure. And I did so directly. I'm so impressed, first of all. But second of all, I'm kind of, I'm kind of just watching myself and how I'm reacting to this and thinking that that freedom to add and subtract things and, and just go with the flow I'm absolutely comfortable with that in the studio. But I guess when I was thinking about that, I was like, it's this enormous thing. It's a public work. I'm imagining there's people that needed to see what it was going to be like. And and this is just me, like my own kind of trying to put myself into that situation. I think I'd be really worried about, it's one thing when you're doing it for yourself in the studio. It's another thing when it's sort of a commission project, when, you know, this is a huge project and there's a lot of people who are probably watching it since it's a public piece. Mm -hmm. So you didn't feel any of that. I mean, I felt the responsibility of it. You know, I mean, partly when you accept a, a commission like that, you're committing to 
a community in a way, and you're being paid, and it's a great responsibility. And yet, one of the things I was responsible for was inventing something that was engaging. And I felt that I couldn't invent something engaging unless I was willing to take a chance and to be engaged myself, to respond to my environment, to mm-hmm. add things when it seemed imperative that something should be there that hadn't been in my original thinking. I love the fact that people were coming in and sharing their opinions. It's It sounds very similar to what happens, I think, not probably not as much, though, when people do plain air painting, you're sort of, you're out there and it's right. just by itself, it's sort of an invitation because people are curious mm-hmm. and it's not something they see every day. And so something like this, that is a big community project, were you able to see some of the reactions from the community? Yeah. In fact, it, that's really interesting because what happened, I think the thing that pleased me most about response was that people saw themselves in, in the work. Mm. And I don't mean just that they could imagine themselves occupying the world that I painted, but that they literally saw themselves in the work. So I have a guy, a figure in that piece that's a jogger. And you know how joggers will stretch. They put their leg up on something and lean in and stretch. And a guy came in with his wife and pointed up to this jogger figure and said, see, you know, as in, (laughs) see, I am really there. I I got a phone call from a woman who said, she actually talked to my daughter, I was away, and she said, you know, I'm in your father's mural. And I was just so thrilled and wondered if I could just use the image on my web (laughs) page to represent me. (laughs) But all of these were invented figures. Oh, that's so funny. Yeah. And I think that what happened was that the figures became somewhat archetypal. Mm -hmm. And so people could project themselves into the figures because of the physical attitudes, but there was nothing about the face or expression that was ever done in relation to any individual, and yet people saw themselves in the work. That is, to me, this you know, especially for a piece like that, that to me is a, an amazing success. Yeah. Yeah. The other example of that that's a little bit more, what's the word I was looking for? I don't know, There's there's a time lag, is that One of the pieces I did in St. Paul, which was one of the panels, was about the African-American experience and the railroad. And African-American workers were Pullman car porters and dining car waiters and so forth. And they were very accomplished people Mm -hmm. and very highly regarded in their communities. And there is a um, reunion, I think, every year of the descendants of people that had those jobs. And it seems like in the last year or two, they've always made a point of having the reunion photograph done with the backdrop of that painting. Oh, wow. It memorializes the work of their of their forebears. So those things are really great about public work. Yeah, that would be, it just feels like it would be so rewarding and fulfilling on a, on a very different level. Yeah. Would you mind talking a little bit about how you go about getting these commissions or uh, you don't call them a commission. It's there are commissions. It is a commission. Okay. I was thinking there was a different word for it. If it's a, it's a public work commission or something like that. Anyway. Right. Well, first of all, I'm not a great example of this insofar as I haven't gotten a great many of them. I've done maybe four, four works and really in the end, they represent a rather small fraction of all the work that I've done, Mm -hmm. but there are several ways. One is that Most of these things are posted. So they're posted on sites like callforentry.org or publicartist.org. And you can sign up for these things free and and go on and look at postings for public artwork that you can apply for. In the case of the St. Paul Commission, and it's, it's true for many commissions that are publicly funded, they have to be publicly advertised. Since that one was partially funded by the National Transportation Administration, it had to be national because the the tax dollars that paid for it were national. Mm. So I applied, and very typically they'll choose three finalists, and the three finalists are generally interviewed either on-site or or by phone, and that's what happened. I think with that one, it was kind of interesting that they – these things usually have a public – event at which prospective applicants can come and see the space and get questions answered. And I I actually flew from Atlanta to St. Paul for that. 
I think I was the only non-local person that showed up. And I did it because when I read the description, it just sounded like me. It sounded like of all the people I know who paint, I was the best qualified to do this. And of course it was, I was deluding myself. There are no doubt plenty of people who could have done it, but it got me under the plane. I went, I looked and just the whole project really spoke to me. And I was then a finalist and interviewed extensively. And the concerns that they had didn't have to do so much with my competence as an artist. Their questions really revolved around how sensitive I could be to the cultural concerns of the community, how people would be represented. Mm. And I rather expected that. And it was, it was interesting to talk with them about it. And I think it made a big difference that they understood that I greatly respected people that I would seek out advice, I would seek out points of view, which I did. And especially, I think that one of the real sensitive areas was with the African American community there that had been, their community had been split by the interstate highway. And it was, they they had grievances that were very old. And I consulted with people and got great advice from leaders of that community about things that I could include in the mural. So that was one project. I think with the, I did a commission for the Milken Family Foundation in California. And that was a strange thing. I don't know if this story would be of interest, but just in case, I'll make it short. Yeah, I'm curious. I was approached by an architect in Atlanta that was doing a huge, beautiful new wing for the temple, which is the biggest synagogue in the Southeast United States. It's a beautiful project. And he wanted me to do a a mural design, which would be presented to them, and he'd try to sell it. I did a mural design based on music and Judaism, and they didn't go for it. They had just spent $20 million on the building, and they they didn't want to go farther than that, though they did buy a painting from me. But I got really interested in that theme and did a series of works on music and Judaism, which I then photographed and sent out to various institutions that had an interest in Jewish music, Jewish museums, for instance. And one of the people I sent it to was the Milken Archive of Jewish Music in California. I sent these things out and heard nothing for a year and a half. Nobody responded. Nobody even said no. And then all of a sudden, a year and a half later, long after I'd forgotten that I'd done this, I get this call from the Milken Foundation saying, you know, we've been looking at the photographs you sent us for a year and a half. And we wonder whether you'd consider doing a series of 20 paintings for us that would be thematic for these categories of music and Judaism on our virtual museum. And that came out of left field. I, wow. you know, it, was, it was wonderful. And it was, it was, they were absolutely fabulous people to work with. And in the case of the Piedmont Park mural, I had done some work of outside scenes at Piedmont Park, which is, Piedmont Park was designed by Frederick Law Olmsted, who did Central Park in New York. It's a beautiful park. And I did some works that were in my studio at a time when my house was on a tour of homes. And one of the people that came on the, to see on the tour was the head of the Piedmont Park Conservancy. And they called me and said, you know, we just discovered a barrel vault. We took down a suspended ceiling in a Beaux-Arts building, and there's this huge barrel vault. Would you do a mural? So these things were kind of, in some ways, almost accidental. Right. The more systematic I've become in applying for things, the less successful I've become. Oh, that's so funny. (laughs) Yeah. I thought, well, what a good idea. I seem to be getting some good response. And then it's just been deadening silence since. And yet I'm working away and having a great time in my studio. And Well, you never know. A year and a half from now, somebody's going to... Exactly. Gonna... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Which was the first one that you did? Well, early on when I was a grad student, I was approached to do the first student-based mural at UC Santa Barbara. So that was 23 or 24 years old. Right after that, I was commissioned to do a mural in the Tri-Counties Regional Center, which was a center for children. I think that they were kids with developmental difficulties and did a, an animal-themed mural for them. Not a little kitty mural, like a children's book illustration. It was kind of dark and 
quite believable in its way and atmospheric. And then a long period of no mural until Piedmont Park came along. Gotcha. Because, yeah, because I was wondering how that would work if it seems like getting those kinds of commissions, the difficulty is being in that position of they want to know that you can do this. Mm -hmm. And so getting the first one's almost impossible because they want to see examples of. (laughs) Right, right. Indeed, I think people who commission public works don't exactly get that opportunity often. And they're not practiced at it necessarily, no. and perhaps don't have tremendous confidence. So they want to know that other people have supported you and that you've been successful elsewhere. But if I could say one more thing about this whole process, one of the issues for me has been the direction that public art has taken generally. What I do, which is narrative, figurative painting, is just not the flavor of the month. And I think the reason is that in in public venues like airports, for instance, and large municipal buildings, first of all, architects are looking for things that are very contemporary, generally non-figurative, that absolutely have, there's, where there's no risk of offending anybody because of content. Mm. And the associations they have with the kind of work I do often take them back to the 1930s and WPA times, Mm -hmm. which is unfortunate, but it means that there's just a very limited call for the kind of work I do. And that the irony of this is that when you read descriptions of public works, they'll frequently sound perfect for narrative painting. They'll say, we want somebody who can really tell the story of the struggle in our community and how our community has grown and become diverse and all this stuff that sounds like narration, depiction, description. And then, you know, they end up choosing something that's a thousand pieces of glass suspended from the ceiling. Right. That that most people aren't going to understand that that's what it's supposed to mean. They just see, right. you know, unless they read something about it. Right. So I don't think I'm competing exactly with that many painters who are like myself, so much as that the challenge is to find a project where somebody like me would be a good fit. Mm. Or convincing them that, that that figurative narrative work is a good fit and that it can be done. Right. There has to be somebody on the committee who's persuasive in that regard because you don't have an opportunity to convince anybody if you don't become a finalist. Mm. Interesting. So can you tell me a little bit about your own personal work, the work that you do for yourself? Mm -hmm. I've I've always worked in series. So I find a theme that really interests me and and I'll spend a couple of years and really look at it pretty exhaustively. The most recent, the current work that I've just put on my website is all based on modern and contemporary poetry. Mm -hmm. And I was just interested in reading poetry and how evocative it could be, especially when the metaphors were visual. So, as I've said in things I've written, when poems you use words like loss, love, desire, those things don't eventuate so easily into visual imagery, but when imagery refers to the visible world, poetry, I thought, became a wonderful source for imagery. And of course, there's a great history of literature as the basis for painting from the Bible, certainly, to Greek myth, to Shakespeare. I think that the distinction that I'm making that's really important to me is that I'm not illustrating poems, that I'm basing paintings, drawings, watercolors on the imagery of poems, but I'm using the poems as a model, and I'm interpreting that model in a very subjective way, so that the paintings have a life of their own, and they don't need to be explained by the poem, they don't need to be shown side by side with the poem. They have their own presence and their own meaning. I somehow think of this great musical composition, Pictures at an Exhibition by Mussorgsky, the Russian composer, who wrote a pretty extensive tone poem based on paintings he'd seen in an exhibit. Hmm. Well, nobody really knows what those paintings were anymore. And it doesn't matter because the work of the musical work survives and is, is just wonderful in its own right. 
Now, the poems that I base my paintings on aren't going to disappear. They're wonderful works. But in the Mussorgsky sense, my paintings are meant to have a life of their own, independent of the, the works that inspired them. Are there themes that you are particularly attracted to when you're selecting the poetry? They're almost always involving human relationships. And they almost always have something to do with some insight into the nature of being or the nature of desire that I think is best expressed through poetry. And I have a couple of my own rules that I developed. Rules might not be quite the right word, but guidelines that I I look at poems that are not overly long because I it's very interest it's very important to me that they're evocative rather than overly specific in their narratives, that they evoke, that they show rather than tell, mm. that their imagery is visible, physical, tangible, that they're not translations. Mm. Why not any translations? Because I want to, this is interdisciplinary in its way. Obviously, I'm not collaborating because these poets are not here for me to, to work with. But I have a sort of my own collaborative feeling about the work. And I just wanted work that I'm reading in the original language. And I'm making a comparison with you now that I've never made before, but it would be a little bit like the difference between looking at a painting in reproduction and looking at it in person. Uh, mm -hmm. And we know that in person, I would say then in its original language, the language of paint and canvas and proper scale, that it's a, it's a special experience which can't be replicated when it's mediated through another another medium. That makes sense. Who are some of your favorite poets? Oh my gosh, I've been looking at Yeats, but there are other people that are less well known here. A woman named Carol Ann Duffy. The father, interestingly, I forget his first name at the moment, but the father of Daniel Day-Lewis, the actor, who is a very, very fine English poet, a woman whose poetry I really fell in love with named Lisa Zarin, who's in Arizona, but also William Carlos Williams and a number of other American English poets. I'm writing all these down. <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll send you a list if you like. I love it. I'm always put on the spot when I have to think of the list <laughs> you know, because I know I'm leaving out somebody very important. Yes, I'm always afraid of that. And I, I usually ask people the very horrible, mean question of if you could own a piece of art by any living artist, what would it be? And that usually causes people panic because they're like, oh, just one and right. I'm going to leave somebody else. Right. So I'm glad you're not asking me that question. Yet. <laughs> okay. I'm kidding. All right. I've been warned. <laughs> What's running through my mind now is just the these sort of memories of being a little kid and I was such a bookworm and then drawing pictures off of the books. And so your paintings feel like, you know, when I was seven or eight years old, what I wanted my drawings to look like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's interesting, you know, this whole notion that we learn to read often in conjunction with looking at pictures. Mm. So it's a, it's a very strong, there's a very strong association between visual imagery and text. And I also was not that I chose it for this reason, but I'm not aware of that many other people doing it. David Hockney did some illustrations of poems by the poet Kafafi, and Turner also did did some illustrations with the oh, I'm skipping my mind now, but they're illustrations and, mm -hmm. and I'm very, very purposefully avoiding that designation. That sort of literal feel to it. Right. As opposed to getting the feeling of what's happening. Both the literal and the dependent relationship on the work, on the poet. Right, right. Are you familiar with the website called Brain Pickings? No. I think you will love it. I will write that down or I will send it to you. Thank you. <laughs> it is this woman who does it. She is a voracious reader and a voracious writer. And she kind of connects the dots between all these different authors. Um, and the reason why I'm thinking of it is I don't remember the, the names or the particulars and I, I'll look it up and, 
and send it to you. But I remember her writing about some poetry and there were some paintings included in that of people who had interpreted mm-hmm. it. Um, so I thought you might find that interesting. Yeah, I'd like to, to see it. But I think I think the site of all uh, you know, the site in its entirety. I think you. I, I just have a feeling you will love this site. Great, share it with me. Could I mention one other series of paintings? Of course, because there are a bunch. But one series I did was when my youngest daughter was a baby and before she could speak. It was interesting to go into her room and she was lying in her crib and it was very obvious that she was dreaming, but she didn't yet have the power of language. So I thought, well, what would it be like? How would a dream be if you couldn't put a dream into words or if you didn't have the symbolic power of words? How would a baby dream? And it just got me thinking about that as a theme. And it was also a time when I was traveling to Spain and spent time in the Prado. And I did this whole series called The Dream Life of Babies that was all of you know, they depict her dreaming. And I'd been working on the Piedmont Park mural, and my daughter was born at about the same time, my youngest one, and was just really interested in the fact that she was clearly dreaming while sleeping, but before she had the power of language. She wasn't yet speaking, and yet you could see her dreaming. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about what, what that must be like if you don't have the power of language and the symbolism of words. What kind of dreams could you have? You couldn't repeat them to yourself or remember them exactly in words. So I got involved in this series of works after doing a huge outdoor-oriented project with this interior world of a baby's dreams and did a series I called The Dream Life of Babies. And it was all fantasy. Of course, I can't know, never would know what she was dreaming, but they were about dreaming and about a child dreaming. And it's just an interesting, it was a wonderful subject for me. Yeah, it's fascinating just to think about that. It's kind of taking this idea of not naming things Mm -hmm. on on steroids almost, you know, because... (laughs) Right. I mean, it would have to have been a perfectly, a world of the senses, but not a world of language as, as a symbol for those experiences. What did you learn from that? Did you have any insights from sort of pursuing that that relate to your own work? Is that a vague question? It's not a vague question. I think my, I'd have to collect my thoughts about it. I mean, I know that I've learned special things from each project. And I guess that was a time I had previously done a a series of works on puppets in the puppet theater. And I think this was a step further in that direction. They're dark paintings. And one of the things that I've been concerned about with all of my work has been not to paint objects, but to paint worlds. What I mean by that is that I'm not interested in, well, let me start that slightly differently. The figures are almost the last things that occur in my works. Hmm. That is, there may be a kind of rough approximation of a figure and an idea of a figure, but I'm really developing a space I'm developing a point of view, an eye level, a light source, a sense of color before any object becomes particularly well-defined. And I think that in that series of works, that that really became an important approach. And I think I I kind of codified it in that that body of work. That what I see too often, I certainly see it in, in people who are learning to paint and to draw, that, you know, they'll do... a painting and a figure gets all of their attention and the figure is, is, is made to be as good as they can make it. And then there's this big afterthought, okay, now what do I put around it? And that's the, exactly the opposite of the way I think. I think in terms of, of creating a stage, an environment, and that stage or environment has to in and of itself tell a story. Just like walking into a theater and seeing a set without a curtain, the set is open. And like the set of Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. And before the actors come out, the story has already begun to unfold through the set. But then the actors come out and they take their place and spotlights are are shown on them. That's somehow the way that I conceive of building the painting. Mm. 
Mm. And I think that was very true of that particular set of paintings. Interesting. Is that a piece of an answer of your question? It is. It is. And it, and it leads me to another question. Would you mind describing your process? I mean, you did just describe your thought process. Now I'm curious about your, the physical process of building the painting. Well, it begins with, with thumbnails, and they tend to be rough, but they're small, maybe paperback novel-sized. Then drawings, charcoal drawings usually, that are more developed. But then when I go to canvas, I always work in grisaille. So I'm working not in black and white gray, but monochromatically, usually an umber and white. And I'm working opaquely with body color. And I think I'm freest to invent when I'm not dealing with strong contrasts of hue, that I can, I can push shapes into each other, I can expand shapes, I can contract them. I'm just much freer to, to mold the painting and to make changes when color does not become a factor. So the works are fairly high key, they're monochromatic, and at a certain point, when my direction is firmly established, I'll begin to work into that in color, and often with transparencies, but the transparencies are definitely placed over very strong body color. So I don't like the idea of tinting or dyeing a canvas. I really want this to be a painting, and I want it to have the characteristics of oil paint, that it's a viscous, mineral-based, heavy material, and I want that physicality and tangibility of paint to be evident before any glazing takes place. But over that monochromatic underpainting, transparencies, and then alternating transparent and opaque, painting opaque into transparent glazes, a lot of um, fusion of edges. I back up a lot. I'm constantly considering the whole. And maybe another interesting notion that comes to me from my former colleague, Jim McGarrell, was not to work on objects, but to work on zones. If the painting is big, I can't work literally on all of it at once. But I can work on a zone of painting, and the zone means that any number of objects may be within a zone that is, spaces or objects. And I'm never focused on only one, but always the nexus between things. Interesting. Because, I mean, when I see your your paintings, you can see a richness of texture. Mm -hmm. And they remind me a lot of pastels for some reason, just mm -hmm. the way that it's it's layered up, even though I know that they're not. So, which keeps me staring at them and trying to figure out why that is, <laughs> what is it that I'm responding to? Yeah, the color part is is probably because I'm red green colorblind. So, ah, yes, <laughs> maybe that explains things. But it means that I work in a range that I feel competent with. And I'm probably I'm probably more oriented toward value and temperature than I am to strong hue. Uh huh. That makes a lot of sense because I can see that in the way that you turn the form and very much. I didn't I didn't realize that. I don't advertise it though. I guess it's too late now. <laughs> well, you know, the very interesting thing is you're the second artist that I've interviewed in in just the last month or two that's colorblind. Mm -hmm. And you said red, gray, colorblind. So red, red, green. Red, green. Okay. Yeah. These two go together and they're not that uncommon among men. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I'm sorry. I had no idea. So I'm like, wow. <laughs> yeah. So how do you deal with that when you're painting? I'm very, now I'm very curious because this other artist that I interviewed had this very interesting way. He, he actually has somebody come in and mix colors for him. How sad. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe it's not sad. I, I couldn't do that. I just figured... Well, he directs... He, he's very, very much involved in it, but it's not oh, like... I'm, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I don't mean to make fun of anybody's disability, but I think my, my approach is just a belief that no matter what you call it, everybody's going to see things somewhat differently anyway. Mm -hmm. So the important thing for me is to accept my own, I guess you'd tell them, strengths or limitations and just work with what I've got. So I'm not trying to overcome colorblindness. I'm just using my particular color range. And an interesting thing is that those dot tests, 
that show that you're colorblind if you can't read the seven, mm-hmm. because the seven is subtly in reds and greens and not discernible. The compensation for that is that there is a dot test, a circle filled with dots that has numbers in it that only a colorblind person can see. And that's because the compensation for colorblindness is a rather acute sensitivity to value change. Mm. So that's just where I am. And, and I go with what I've got. I tell the story not infrequently that at one of my openings, somebody came up to me and he said, you know, I really love your color. It's just the best. And he said, I've never said this to an artist because, well, I admit it, I'm red, green, colorblind. And I thought, <laughs> well, of course you like my color. You're the one person that sees it the way I do. <laughs> that is fantastic. So I was just scrolling, scrolling through some of them. I, I don't know how you would, but it's not, I'm right now I'm sitting there thinking like, is there a way that you could look at this and tell? And I there, no, there's not, at least to my eye. <laughs> well, I think, you know, you, you think about most painters, they really have their own palette. Mm-hmm. And I think mine is just, is just, you know, I, I have a range that sort of works for me just the way I don't mean to compare myself to somebody so august, but Degas' palette or Lautrec's palette, they have their palette, you know, and and at my humble level, I have mine. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So now I do want to ask you that horribly mean question that if you could own a piece of art by any living artist, what would it be or whose? And you can say more than one if you want. And you don't have to worry about leaving anyone out. I can't say less than one. (laughs) (laughs) And it's... Well, I'll, I'll give you a funny answer. I, I'm quite sure this person is still living, and he's not a painter. There's a sculptor named Jack Zajac, Z-A-J-A-C, who did these wonderful small bronze sculptures of goats that were goats that I think had been either slaughtered or ready for slaughter. They were in really contorted positions, and I've always loved them, and I've always wished that I could own one. I got to meet him once a long time ago, and his work is, you know, you can find him easily enough on the web. If I could own one of his small pieces, I would be very, very delighted to, to, to live with that. It's not that I don't admire other painters, because I do, and I'm dazzled by things that I see, but I think I kind of live in my own world a little bit. Yeah. I'm not all that involved in the art world, and I don't think I'm that aware. I mean, I'm just not that knowledgeable about who's out there and what they're all doing. Well, the reason that I ask that question is because most of the time I get to discover a new artist. So it's a little bit selfish. (laughs) Well, that's a great reason to ask a question. (laughs) Probably the best reason. (laughs) So it's not meant to be a test of, I don't know, your contemporary art knowledge or anything like that. Good. Okay. I'm curious, could you describe a single habit that you strongly believe contributes to your growth as an artist or your success as an artist? A habit. Well, I work a lot. I'm very steady. I mean, I do have a teaching job, and that's two long days a week. But I'm in my studio, and being there, as Woody Allen said, is 90% of winning. I forget his exact percentage, but I make it a point to be in my studio I cannot wear a watch or have a clock anywhere near me when I work. Mm. For some reason, that just, it's the kind of sense of not being aware of time passing that I try to attain when I work. I don't have to work at it. I just don't want to be reminded of the time and time passing. And another habit, I guess, it's interesting, I haven't thought of these as habits exactly, is that I always start a lot of work. So I would never start a painting and finish it before going on to the next work. Mm. I start many things at once, and I'm constantly going back and forth between works. There are works in a series, and you know I find that they're inevitably going to inform each other. Mm-hmm. When I get stuck on one, I move to the next, and the solution that I needed in the previous painting emerges. So it's always a matter of starting a lot of things, bringing them all up together, it's always been difficult for me to answer the question, how long did it take to do this? Yeah. Because I've distributed my time among many works that are concurrently being developed. 
I love that. It's a great habit, I think. And it, it's common among a lot of artists because of that ability to mm-hmm. that. I mean, I guess that benefit of being able to take what you learn from one painting into another and then mm-hmm. respond back to that first painting with what you learned from the second. Another thing that I avoid is I don't, I tend not to want to make commitments to show my work if I haven't finished the work and lived with it for a while. Mm. I have painters, a couple of painter friends who are very, very good and I admire them tremendously and they can agree to a show in a year and then produce the work <laughs> and, and they're successful at it. You know, I admire that in them. Something I could never do. I really have to give the work whatever time it needs and let it take me wherever it wants to go. When I start work, I'm very concerned to have a direction, but I never exactly have a destination. In other words, I don't really know where it's going to end up. Mm -hmm. I just know that I'm going, when when it starts to work for me, I know the direction is right and that the destination is to be discovered. And that's what keeps me going. That's the part to me that's just so exciting (laughs) is Mm -hmm. not knowing where, you know, just it's kind of like going on a road trip and you sort of know you're going to eventually get to Chicago, for example. But what happens in between (laughs) is anyone's guess. Well, that's that's really using just the language that I was using, having direction and destination is exactly right. Ralph, it has been so wonderful talking to you. I really enjoyed getting to know you. Same. I've enjoyed our conversation very much, Patrice, and appreciate your interest. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. Thank you again to Ralph Gilbert for sharing his stories. Go to SavvyPainter.com and click on the podcast tab. You'll see show notes for this episode. You can see Ralph's work, the murals that we talked about, and get links to connect with him. The Savvy Painter Podcast is made possible in part by listeners like you. So I would like to take a moment to thank you for supporting the Savvy Painter. Much gratitude goes out to Don Chandler, the Roaring Artist, Kenneth Burke, Carla Roth, Virgil Dyson, Maureen Nathan, Alexis Redden, Kathleen Speranza, Kathy Beeler, Gail Height, Barry Koplowitz, Art of Joy, Patricia Matranga, Denise Klitsi, Deb Cook Shapiro, Barbara Chantre, and Pat Oxley. Thank you so much for your generous support. You definitely keep this podcast running, and I really, really appreciate it. One more thing I want to let you know, this year you can expect a lot more workshops from Savvy Painter. If you are an artist who struggles with getting painting time in or feels like you're always busy but never really moving forward with your art, then my workshops just might interest you. Past workshops include Mindset Mastery, a five-week online workshop to help you get past the roadblocks that keep you from painting. In it, we tackle the inner critic, fears of artists, and setting yourself up for a successful creative day. The workshop, How to Develop a Relationship with the Right Gallery, helped several artists find the right gallery and show their work. So if this is something that interests you, you can go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop and get on the email list. This is separate from the main list that tells you when a new episode comes out. This is just for the workshop. So you don't get quite as many emails, but when you do, there's always something really good happening. Sign up now and get a downloadable PDF with case studies that tell you exactly how three artists pushed through barriers that were getting in the way of their studio time. You can, for example, learn how Rhonda went from not wanting to call herself an artist to getting her very first solo show. Also, listen to an introverted artist describe how she built her confidence and then spoke in front of an audience of her peers. And you can discover the tools that Samantha used to take back her power after a decade of believing that she had no, I'm putting air quotes there, she had no talent. So again, go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop to reserve your place on the list. When you sign up, you get that downloadable case studies that I mentioned, but more importantly, you get exclusive invites to upcoming workshops. Most of the time when I launch a new program, it sells out before I ever announce it publicly. So reserve your spot now at SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop. Until next week, this is Antrice Wood with the Savvy Painter podcast. Thank you so much for listening. 